I wanted to uh, touch on something two things quick, but it, you talk about the uh, this sort of androgynous body uh, coming out of transition from working with through male gymnasts to female gymnasts. Um, but it's so obviously uh, similar to what Balanchine was doing, uh, sort of transforming the, the ballet body at uh, a similar time. And I wonder if you had any comment on sort of the, the androgyny of the female athletic body in those two. Yeah, I mean, I really had very kind of practical reasons in terms of, I mean, obviously the Soviets were kind of quite leading in the field of kind of biomechanics and sports science. Um, and quite simply, I mean, before then, the female gymnasts were doing a lot of dance and very kind of graceful movement. The idea of showing exertion was um, not feminine. Um, and so uh, this, this shift um, was quite dramatic. And it wasn't, it wasn't something that the gymnastics community just accepted. It was controversial. Um, and there were some moves banned at that very early moment that are still banned. Um, but the male coaches understood where the centre of gravity was um, in, a, in, a, in a different way. But it was also, I mean, there were risks with those, this new kind of ac uh, acrobatic emphasis that they had, which the young female gymnasts, as opposed to um, kind of women in their early 20s or mid 20s, they were they could be bullied into taking the risks that uh, a woman might say, you know, actually that's pretty dangerous. <laughs> Um, and, and that's part of the centralised training boarding school type scenario as well. Um, but I mean, I would say that gymnastics is moving away from that. The uh, the quota points changed in the early 2000s, so there is actually now more diversity in terms of the body shapes that you can perform and win with. Uh, whereas there's, there was this idea before, like, oh, you're like five foot three, or you're too tall, like gymnastics is not going to be for you. <laughs> Um, whereas now there is more of a diversity, I would say that the image of uh, gymnasts in popular culture has not caught up with that yet. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out, and it is giving gymnasts a bit more longevity, although that's kind of complex because that's maybe also to do with um, progress in terms of medicine and being able to reconfigure joints and things which you could do before. Um, I've got a question. I'm trying to see if I can stick them together. <laughs> um, thank you very much for three incredibly rich and um, important papers. So I'm going to pick up on the phrase that you used at the end, Roderick, which is the, the kinesthetic experience and sort of summing up um, about the pleasure and the dis um, of, of the practice through it. And for me, that actually is the thread that I found in all of the different papers, either to problematize that idea or to use it as a kind of empowering tool. So I just wondered whether, so Tiffany, in your paper, um, the kinesthetic experience of, I guess, those images of what, witnessing the images of the coach in those, in those powerful positions in relation to the gymnasts um, and the troubling nature of that, the kinesthetic experience of me watching it or the audience watching it, and then in your paper, um, the incredibly evocative uh, moving images and, and what that produces in, again in the audience. And Roger, for you, I guess using that as a, as a rationale for why you know why you're doing what you're doing, I thought oh, actually that was a really um, really powerful way to finish. I just wondered if you had any each of you had any responses on when does kinesthetic experience become a, become troubling and when can it become uh, almost like a well, from the audience perspective or from your own practical perspective when can it become where can we can we trouble that concept and can we not add because the the, the tendency is to, to think of it as an empowering tool but can it also be a troubling tool I guess does that make sense as a question in terms of deviance and defiance. For the audience or for... Uh, well, from whatever perspective, I guess. Yes, I guess for yourself, for Tiffany and yourself, it's probably from a from the audience perspective, but maybe even for Broderick, is it... Can it? Can you see it as a troubling thing? Can it become a self-fulfilling... I think what, what's potentially troubling for dominant discourses about sport and performance is when it becomes, um, goes into pain and yeah. pain and also um, 
when, when we actively kind of court the body breaking down in some way, because it reminds us then of our own complicity in watching this horrible thing yes, that's happening. Yes. Um, and also like our complicity in paying like another individual to perform yeah. these actions um, that um, becomes, you know, uncomfortably close to, to modes of like things like um, a, a maid or a butler, but also a prostitution and so on. So like there's a, you know, this is getting into like kind of Marxist analysis, but that that would be where I find where it makes that labor economy really, really visible. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that it happens when you watch um, uh, a dance performance where you really convince that the the dancers are there's like a kind of real joy in what they're doing, but then you also see like the damage that's being inflicted exactly. to the body at the same time. And then, and especially if you're watching in a place like Sadler's Wells or something, and then you're going, oh, I paid all this money for for this Watch thing to this, happen. Yes. Um, and then similarly in sport, I think there's still an expectation that the body has to perform functionally, and we don't really, we don't want to see injury. Um, and yeah. so our discomfort with it um, comes from, from that. In terms of the urban big project, I think um, these deviance was in a sense constructed mm. to to trouble the audience. The, the, the audience want, they wanted to, the audience to feel troubled, to feel uncomfortable. Um, now, if there was an unintentional discomfort, I am not too sure. I have been there a few times, uh, of course, in some of their performances. And it does create a, a sense of uh, sometimes suffocation. Uh, uh, it can be quite unpleasant. But I think uh, they do this with an intention to make you feel unpleasant and reflect as audience. Why? What is this body movement, this moving body, wants to give me as a message? Uh, of course, to the, to the dancers or to the actors themselves, there is this extreme physicality of climbing down 60 meters or and the pain and, and all this. Uh, but um, I think most of what's going on within the Arabic project is kind of controlled. I think perhaps the only thing that I would add, just maybe for uh, so I, I did in a different lifetime and body now uh, gymnastics and trampoline and competitive as a child. And so I think that maybe what's in some respects, you know, you're undertaking this activity when you already have, um, you know, a whole wealth of knowledge and consciousness. And actually, I grew up looking at these images and not realizing that they were problematic. And then it was really kind of in about 2012 when I kind of was, you know, doing some reading to my masters and I was looking at these images again and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, like these leotard brochures that I've been looking at my whole life and thinking, oh god, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly they look different and so I think that in many, this kind of research for me is kind of like a, like a revisiting okay. and a, a, like re-evaluating um, of what was kind of once totally accepted by my uh, yeah, childhood eyes and then kind of delving into those uh, just only a very quick uh, point as well in terms of your experience that your you coming to the to, to, to train seems as a not really working in a sense. But this is different in, in our context that we are sport academics. We are expected to actually have a, a fluidity from our office to the sports center. Because if we do I am a sociologist, I'm not eating physiology and biomechanics that are expected to be more sport. But if I am not into the sport environment, I am the outsider. So it's part of our context that we have to do some kind of activity to, to be part of it. So it is very socially constructed element and then very, I like what you said about it, it was singing or yeah. something, it's different. Sport has, comes with this kind of stigma, but within the sport environment of academics, no matter what we do, if we're not involved in sport, we don't fit in somehow in the, in the, in the public imagination of what is for within our community. Yeah. But I wonder whether that's, I mean, for example, you know, from, from and that's selling solar, um, there is an expectation that to some extent I would also be engaging in, in practice to have an unembodied understanding of it. I wonder whether what Roderick's talking about is the crossing over of disciplinary practice. So within our little worlds, yes. we're all in, expected to, to do everything. Yes. <laughs> but as soon as we cross over, there's some kind of I think if I was doing uh, singing, 
If they are, it would be the other way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what are you doing there in the singing studio? Did you have a question? I was going to finish it quick. I was just going to juxtaposition there when you said about points were really performing grace, yet at the same time the athletes were trying to were almost like to mind or something less understanding at the same time. Is there anything that's all that we've like, actually seen where this research is? I think there's maybe something where there's quite an interesting moment is as I was saying in the early two thousands there's a real change. Yes. And so just before that takes place there are some routines being performed that after the rule change would have uh, scored a lot higher. And then after the, the rule change, everyone's trying to figure things out. And so there's actually, in some respects, quite a lot of creativity uh, where people are trying to push in different ways and say, well, will this get a really good mark or maybe this will get a good mark? So that was quite an interesting moment, I, I think. Um, whereas uh, things were a little bit more fluid because before then it was this perfect 10 score and then after the score change there's now like it's, it's unlimited technically how high this, this score could um, go up. In terms of the kind of idea of feminine grace, and the boy, I mean the language is so vague, <laughs> you know, it, like I mean artistry, artistic gymnastics, well, what does it mean to be artistic in a competitive sport? And I, within the gymnastics community, I think that they themselves have quite a strict idea of what they think this means. It normally means to be uh, balletic, um, to perform to certain kinds of national or folk music, or you know, to piano and to do a certain kind of dance along with the routines. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but you know, that's certainly up for for a lot of debate, and I think it's um, interesting, kind of when. If I ever watch gymnastics with someone from outside and they begin to laugh, what are you laughing at? Like, <laughs> um, Those dance sections, do they have a separate choreographer or do or how are they going to dance? Or? Yeah, so the, one of the interesting things about gymnastics is there is a rotation system. Um, the rotation system is not used for the dance elements, it's only used for the acrobatic skills, which I think is really weird. It's somewhere between kind of um, like those um, rotation systems you get for like boxing and dance rotation. Um, so when they hand in their routine um, for something like before, all that they'll have on it are the, the 10 acrobatic skills that they come up to get a difficulty score and the judges have to write down the symbols. The, the dance choreography is like not recorded anywhere in terms of apart from what say in the camera or um, in some older texts. Does um, it coach choreography? No. So, <laughs> A long time ago, or depending on like different systems, people might have had their own individual choreographer. But now there's normally so, for example, the whole of Team USA, they have one choreographer which explains where all the routines look like, pretty similar. <laughs> but I mean, they're not really basic with the new system. Time is really of the essence, and so if you use up a lot of time for dancing, you're just reducing the amount of time you have to do to get acrobatic skills and enhance your score. So the dance is actually the criticism of a lot of times is like a token gesture thing. Yeah. We're like, oh look, I'm dancing. <laughs> so. that, that, that's one thing I've noticed well, even in the last thing that I really picked up on it, it's like that feminine flair on the floor, on the floor work and stuff, and it kind of like the sort of graceful movement. But to you know, accentuate femininity and what the rules are, but then you don't get guys when they're doing their thing sort of stomping around like this and moving this after each movement. So it's interesting to see how it's judged on one sex, but yeah, I mean, I think there's that moment, um, and long before female gymnastics enters competitively into the Olympics, where any kind of dancing or holding hands that was there in folk gymnastics, perhaps in the Nordic region, for example, um, is kind of seen as being frivolous and inefficient. And so, really, quite early on for male gymnastics, um, that side of things is pushed to the side, um, and then becomes the realm of only the feminine. Um, Sorry. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just one more, and then we'll break for tea and coffee. Maybe switch your legs. Thank you. Uh, I had two, but I'll keep it to one since the time. The second one was about race that might apply, but I'm really interested in the diva, and uh, forgive me if this has already been um, asked. I, I ran and got us all coffee cups, that's why I left. No, <laughs> forgive me if this has already been asked, but I, was, I really like how you captured the silencing of the female yeah. um, subjects, and I was wondering how much the recent expose that's happening in America, um, like 60 Minutes exposed, kind of a Catholic Church type of expose of the doctors that have been taking care of these 
athletes um, have, have been sexually assaulting them, and the system of silence that perpetuated that. And I'm wondering how much of the diva label and narrative is echoed or comes from the female subjects themselves, and if there is minimal amount of that, how much is the diva label and narrative just another tool of the male coaches to accentuate their trophies as virtuosic? And, and, and how do you navigate the politics and ethics of that in using the diva narrative? I mean, I think one of the things, maybe, this is quite a kind of new, uh, slight venture for me. I want to write about this, and I want to write about the captainess of the gymnastics, and these are my two adventures. Um, the label of diva, I would say, is generally applied to gymnasts from the former Soviet bloc. So I'm not really aware of it being applied to um, gymnasts from the US. I think because the commentators like to shape and mold this kind of golden girl image more, this is kind of what they're, they're going for um, in these kind of fluff pieces that they do. Um, in terms of the, I mean, it, gymnastics has a really murky history in it. I mean, in some respects, what's happening in the, the US is kind of just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know if anyone has heard before, there was a practice, well, we were practice of a Russian doping where girls um, were uh, forced to get pregnant because in the first few months you gain extra um, muscle and then it was terminated. So I mean there was really, I mean really, it's just the tip of the iceberg of some of the more awful things um, that were going on. And I, um, the silences around that, I mean and it's, it's, an, it's an aesthetic sport, it's one of the big four sports in these, uh, you know, China, Russia, and the US are some of the most populous nations. It's very uh, competitive. You have a very short time frame to do things. And so the sacrifices that uh, young female gymnasts were kind of maybe bullied into making, or their parents kind of felt, oh, we're just not going to deal with this. Um, it's, and I mean, gymnastics is really expensive as well. You know, especially if you're not in that centralized training system. So I think that that's what's kind of nurtured this kind of climate of like silence and denial and just like moving somebody on. But obviously how it's unfolded in the US has been. And there's there's always, I mean, those some of those book covers I showed them, you would see this slide, where these kind of tell-all books, I think that that's kind of why there's um, so much appetite for those kind of um, things. Ironically, also like gymnastic cookbooks. Really? Yeah. Well, and gymnastics <laughs> where you used to advertise a lot of sanitary products as well, which is weird because they don't get periods because... You know, they're so young and they have eating disorders. This is yeah. very strange. Uh, this kind of, that part of the group on here. Well, I think we can probably continue these discussions over coffee and throughout the day. But, John, you've been